Good morning, everyone. This is Shait Ali Bak from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe, based out of Cyprus. And ABU is continuing with its countdown to the 89th Indian Air Force Day. Today, we are remembering the stellar role of Indian Air Force in helping Friends of India whenever they are in need. One such major role was in Operation Cactus. The year was 1988, and the location was Maldives. The mission was to rescue the key government ministers who were taken hostage and get back President Mamun Abdul Gayum of Maldives, who managed to go into a safe house after a coup attempt. And to hear the success story of Indian Air Force in this operation, we have with us Group Captain Ashok Chaudhia, who was not only a part of this mission, but also documented the complete operation in a form of a book. ADU is privileged to have you on the show, sir, and we wait with a bated breath to hear the story from the horse's mouth. From here, I request our editor, Sangeeta Saxena, to take it forward. Thank you very much, Atali. Welcome, Group Captain Chodhya. It's wonderful to have you on the show with us. And, uh, you know, it's, we've been waiting and waiting for the occasion to come when we get to talk to you and when we understand what it was all about. My first question, sir, to you is, can you give a little gist about the complete operation to us? Uh, it's a pleasure being uh, sharing the screen with you, ma'am. I feel really honored. Uh, Thank you so much. This operation, uh, it took place in 1988, as Chetali just mentioned. Uh, it was November the 3rd. Uh, the terrorists, led by Abdullah, Abdullah Lutufi had landed in uh, the town of Male, the city of Male. And the aim was to overthrow the government of uh, President Mohammed Abdul Gayoum. Uh, the president went into hiding and from there he started sending SOS messages to a lot of countries, the US, the UK, uh, several uh, Commonwealth countries, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, uh, all of them uh, said they were uh, trying to do something, but uh, no one came with concrete help. India, although it was busy in Sri Lanka, India came up with military assistance and uh, rest is history. The Indian Air Force airlifted the paratroopers from Agra. Uh, the paratroopers rescued the president and secured the islands. And uh, the terrorists who were running away with uh, some hostages were chased by the Indian Navy and uh, the hostages were rescued. That's how the operation came to an end. It proved the prowess of Indian military and diplomacy. So, uh, you know, that's, that was a very nice gist so that our audience know what we are going to now talk about. My first thing is, it was the fastest military airlift ever. And just keeping that in mind, would you like to narrate what happened on the 3rd of November, 1980? Uh, I was then a flight lieutenant posted in the paratroopers training school, Agra. And that day I was supposed to be leaving for uh, the National Defense Academy for a skydiving demonstration. I was leading a team there. And then we were, the movement was put on hold and we were asked to wait for further orders. And then I was removed from there and I felt very bad about it because uh, going to the alma mater and doing a skydiving demonstration is a dream every time and you want to be there always and uh, I was moved out from there and then subsequently I was told that we are heading uh, somewhere else. We were not told where we were going. So the preparations were going on on the tarmac of 44 squadron. The aircraft were getting ready. The troops had arrived. There were uh, the parachutes were loaded. The troops were uh, seated in the aircraft and uh, until uh, the aircraft had taken off and we were uh, already about halfway through. We didn't come to know where we were going. So uh, th that was the amount of secrecy that was maintained. And uh, once the aircraft were ready and we were about to taxi out, uh, Brigadier Bulsara called me and he said, which aircraft is going first? He asked me and uh, I knew for uh, sure that the aircraft in which the top brass of the Air Force Group Captain Goyal and Group Captain Babur were sitting, would be the lead aircraft. 
So I told him that the other aircraft in which the two senior Air Force officers were sitting would be the lead aircraft. Uh, so he was puzzled and he said, no, my aircraft must go first. I said, now it's too late. The, uh, I mean, uh, the engines have already started whining and uh, we'll be uh, taxing out very soon. He said, no, you go and tell them that uh, this aircraft must, uh, my aircraft must go first, otherwise the operation will go for a six. All the plans have been made accordingly. I mean, the people sitting in the other aircraft are not aware. They don't even know where we are going. So I ran to the other aircraft. In the heart of my heart as a young flight lieutenant, that was, I was too happy. I wanted my aircraft to be in the lead. So I went and made a very serious face and uh, told the two officers there, Group Captain Goel and Group Captain Bebur, that sir, uh, Group Captain, uh, sorry, uh, Brigadier Bulsara is uh, saying that the other aircraft must land there first, must lead. So he said, uh, they said, no, nothing can be done. The Form 700 has been signed. The author book has been signed. All the documentation has been done. We don't know. Uh, we have not checked the other aircraft. So we can't uh, make a change like this. So I came back very sadly and told uh, Brigadier Bulsara, sorry, sir, uh, such a thing is not possible. So he sent me again. And this time it was with uh, uh, Major Bhatia, who was his, uh, uh, who was uh, with him in the brigade. So two of us went there and uh, this time they couldn't say no. I mean, they understood the seriousness of the thing and something which never happens uh, in uh, normal operations, uh, with, it's against the SOP. You don't change the aircraft last minute like this. The crew of the, uh, the aircraft in which uh, these two senior officers were was uh, brought to this aircraft and uh, the, I mean, there was an interchange of the crew and that's how both the top leaders were in the same aircraft. And if I may say it uh, in a very simple language, all the eggs were in one basket. If this aircraft had not gone there and if the, this aircraft has, had got stuck for some reasons, uh, the operation would have been very difficult because in the other aircraft, people were not fully aware what was going to take place. So once the I... aircraft took off, the uh, there were no maps and uh, they had carried some uh, coffee table book, uh, books and they had carried some uh, Xerox copies of some pages from those books. They were being shared by people. And that's when I came to know that we are not heading for Trivandrum, which was the thought process in our minds, Trivandrum and Sulur, from where uh, the IPK of operations were taking place. And uh, we, uh, the briefing to the troops was taking place in the aircraft. Another thing which never happens normally was the priming of the grenades and the issuing of the ammunition in the aircraft. It is never done, but as a special case, it was being done. So, uh, it went on and on. And uh, my job in the aircraft was to prepare troops in case a para drop was required. So I was uh, busy thinking about a para drop. The, I mean, the preparations went on and on for four hours. And uh, finally, uh, if you want me to continue, I will uh, tell you the entire story or you'd have... Uh, no, I really wanted to, you know, ask you one very important thing. You know, how did you maintain the secrecy? How did Indian Air Force maintain the secrecy? Because uh, definitely we didn't want the mercenaries there to know that it was an IAF flight which was coming. And uh, you know, so how did they do it? Uh, as you know, the mercenaries, uh, the terrorists were on uh, the island of Malay. And uh, if they had an inkling that uh, something like this was happening, even two or three terrorists uh, sitting on the runway could have uh, prevented the aircraft from landing. They could have shot it down even before yes. touching down. So secrecy was paramount. It was most important that secrecy was maintained. First thing was that uh, RT silence was maintained. Uh, there was no communication with anybody. And then, uh, people were being uh, told about the operation on the need to know basis. As I just mentioned, I came to know only after about two hours of takeoff that uh, we were not heading for uh, uh, Trivandrum or Sulur, but we were heading for some other place and Maldives, I didn't even know where the country was. 
So uh, that was the level of secrecy so far as the exchange of notes is concerned among officers, among uh, troops and officers. Then uh, RT silence uh, was maintained throughout. As we were crossing the airspace, the Indian airspace, and we were heading towards uh, Maldives, the air traffic controller at uh, Trivandrum, he wasn't aware that uh, some such thing was happening. So he wanted to stop the aircraft from leaving the Indian airspace. So he started questioning. That's when Group Captain Bevur came up with a bright idea. He asked that fellow uh, about a certain officer, Wing Commander Panikar. Was he there in the uh, control tower? So fortunately he was there or probably he had been sent there. So he came on the air. They spoke in Arabic. Both of them had done a small stint in uh, Iraq and knew Arabic a bit. So he, uh, Group Captain Bevu told him that, please tell this gentleman that we are on a special mission not to ask questions. And that's how we passed through. Communication from uh, Maldives was through a single telephone line, which was activated in the morning when the SOS messages came. And uh, that telephone line was not dropped. The connection was not dropped. Uh, we were getting messages all through uh, on that line. The fear was that in case that call got disconnected, probably we wouldn't get any messages. So that telephone line was another uh, thing that was uh, of great help. And uh, on that telephone line, messages were conveyed and the air traffic, uh, it was decided with the air traffic control that they will uh, share a particular code word. It was hudia, hudia, hudia. In case the runway was safe, they would give that call. Otherwise, they wouldn't use that uh, code word and we would go back to Trivandrum. So the secrecy was maintained at all levels and all through the operation. In sir, those days, this telephone uh, communication you're talking about, was it satellite even in those days, satellite communication? Uh, with Maldives, it was satellite com communication. And sir, did Indian Air Force have a plan B if something went wrong? And uh, what was that plan B they had? Uh, under the circumstances, the plan A was to somehow position troops on the island of Hulule, where the runway was. And yes. uh, the troops would go uh, in boats, would take the speed boats which were available there to the island of Mali and rescue the president and uh, restore peace there. Uh, plan B, if you may ask me, was to, in case the runway was unsafe, drop one or two paratroopers. That time, Major Dillon was very eager to jump in case uh, the permission was not given to land. So one or two people would land, maybe in another circuit, few more people would land. That's where I would have been of help. I would have been preparing those troops and making them jump. So uh, that situation didn't arise. Uh, in case uh, paradrop wasn't possible and uh, the ter ter terrorists were more in number on the runway, probably we would have gone back to Trivandrum. And next morning, uh, we would have come back in AN-32s and carried out paradrops from a lower height. IL-76, the drop is drop takes place from a much higher height. And on that small island, uh, island of Hulule, troops would have gone into the sea in case we had carried out a paradrop. So uh, slightly lower uh, would have been the drops in case uh, AN-32s had been used next day. So we had plan B. You had a plan. And sir, uh, in addition to the transport aircraft, did you were also fighters in the scene, our fighters uh, or some supporting fighters from the friendly nations, were they also there in the scene? It is interesting that uh, when the initial uh, information came from the Maldivians, the first, few, uh, first message was that there were about uh, 100, 200 uh, terrorists. Then the message was... Uh, 300, 500, then 800, then they said 1,000 uh, terrorists. And the most worrisome message was that they are capable of shooting down an aircraft. So under those circumstances, uh, it was felt that uh, the, the transport formation which was uh, heading towards Maldives must be escorted. So right in the beginning, Miraj Gordon in... Uh, Gwalior was alerted. Uh, six aircraft had moved to Trivandrum. 
<coughs> in the night and they were supposed to escort these uh, IL-76 aircraft to the Maldives. But then it was, uh, I mean, people realized that uh, that requirement was not there. So they stayed put, the Mirage aircraft in uh, Trivandrum. Next morning, they also wanted to be a part of the operation. They said, we have come all this way. And so we must also be, uh, we must also participate. So they were asked to fly low over the islands. It was that uh, mission was uh, taken very lightly. I mean, when they started it, uh, the aim was just to fly low, but then it worked wonders. Quite a few terrorists were left behind by the uh, main team, which ran away from there in the ship. There were so many who were left in the streets and were still firing. They were uh, also scattered in some other islands. But when they saw this, uh, these fighter aircraft flying low, they, some of them, they surrendered. So it worked. The fighters were utilized and they also contributed to the success of the operation. And so what about choppers? At, uh, subsequently, uh, next day onwards, choppers were also uh, placed in. They flew from uh, Sulur and Trivandrum and uh, carried troops and equipment because we didn't know until uh, midday, next day, uh, how things were going to pan out. So they were also utilized. And then subsequently, choppers were utilized to get back troops from there. Initially, they were utilized to carry troops and equipment and rations, etc. But subsequently, they were used for evacuating. Okay. And uh, so, uh, what I wanted to understand is where it was a successful operation. So, what were the factors which contributed to the success? You know, as a military mission, it was a great mission for any military and joint military. So, what were the factors that contributed to its success? Uh, if you look at any military operation, you can always uh, uh, say certain things uh, without hesitation. Leadership, mm -hmm. coordination, selection and maintenance of aim, uh, then uh, secrecy, then uh, flexibility, so many things. You can, you can very coolly attribute all these to any operation, including this one. But uh, I have thought over it for a long time. And something which stands out in this particular case is perception of asymmetry. What I'll just explain it. I'll, I'll, I'll explain yeah. it to you. Uh, normally, uh, I mean, if everything else is uh, same, uh, the numbers matter. If uh, they say terrorists are X number and we are two X, we are stronger. We stand a better chance. Yes. Forget about their ability to block the runway and uh, stopping us. But then uh, only numbers don't matter. In, in our case, we were told that there are about uh, 300, 400, 500, 800. And uh, one of the estimate uh, gave us 1,000 uh, terrorists there. In the first wave, we were just about 320 or so. Two aircraft that landed uh, and made the difference. We were only about 320. So just imagine the asymmetry. It was favoring them so far as the Absolutely. numbers, the known numbers are concerned. I mean, uh, the fact is they were only 8080. And we were 320, four times the number. So the uh, actual uh, numerical superiority was there with us. Now add to that another factor. These people on the island of Malé, when they heard the massive IL-76 aircraft landing, in the night you could hear the sound very clearly, massive aircraft landing, and then you could see the salutes of the troops walking on the uh, island. They could see it from the other island. They were scared. In an interview about 20 years after this operation, Lutufi told one of the newspapers in Sri Lanka that we couldn't have stood a chance against a force of 1,600 troops. We were only 80. So they thought that we were 1,600. We thought they were 1,000. Actually, they were 80 and we were 320. Yeah. So a perception of asymmetry made a big difference. Those people gave up everything and ran. 
whoever could get into the uh, hijacked vessel, uh, that uh, merchant vessel, they got into it and they ran away. So uh, I think it was the perception of asymmetry that mattered. Everything else, yes, of course, leadership, everything, the lightning action and all. But then uh, this is what uh, mattered most because this is what uh, led to these uh, terrorists giving up. So for our audience, you know, we uh, want you to tell us who were actually these mercenaries? Uh, these mercenaries were actually, uh, it so happened that Lutufi, a Maldivian businessman who had almost settled in uh, Sri Lanka, he used to own a duck farm there, I think. He had that brainwave, he joined hands with I don't know who all, and he wanted to overthrow the government of Maldives. He struck a deal with uh, a gentleman called Maheshwaran, leader of uh, uh, People's Liberation Organization of Tamil Elam, a terrorist organization which had broken off from LTTE. Hmm. So the deal was that uh, in case they were able to overthrow the government of uh, Mohammed Abdul Gayum, Lutufi would grant certain uh, number of islands to Maheshwaran in the north of the country in Maldives to carry on with his nefarious activities because uh, he was being hounded. Maheshwaran was being hounded by LTT and by the IPKF and by the Sri Lankan forces. So he wanted something. So Lutufi trained, I mean, uh, he stayed with the Maheshwaran and 80 of his men were trained into uh, trained to carry on, carry out this operation. They set course from there uh, in the end of October, around 26th of October. They were on high seas for some time. They didn't know that President Gayum, who was supposed to be in India around that time, had stayed back. He got an inkling that something like this was happening and he stayed back. So these terrorists were actually mercenaries. You, you can't even call them mercenary, mercenaries. They were not very well treated people. They were not the force that was projected to us. I mean, uh, the first impression was they, that they're ruthless like the LTTE. They weren't. And what happened to them, sir, once uh, the operation was successful? And then uh, what happened to them? I, they were trying to run away. So could you catch them and get them back and hand them over to Maldives or whatever? The terrorists uh, who could uh, manage to get, in, get into the merchant vessel, uh, Progress Light, and the hostages who, go, I mean, they had taken some hostages and they started running away. They were chased by the Indian Navy and uh, caught. The terrorists who were left behind, they were caught by the uh, Indian force, the Indian troops and uh, Sri Lankans. They went for, uh, on a house to house search on several islands and all of them were caught. Then uh, at that time, uh, President Gayum wanted to hang the and some others who had played a key role, uh, some in Maldivians also who were supporting Lutufi. But then uh, it is uh, not on record anywhere, but then it is believed that uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi intervened. And uh, he, uh, Lutufi is on record. He says that I, I am alive because of Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. So, he got a uh, life term. Uh, did he get a yes, life term? Yes, he was, he was to be hanged, but then he got a life term. And I think uh, that life term also didn't last long. He was uh, let off. He was uh, allowed to leave uh, Maldives and settle anywhere else. That's how he was in uh, Sri Lanka and gave an interview after 20 years. Right. Absolutely. And sir, now I'd like to understand from you, what are these vivid images and memories which still come back to you? You know, normally time is a great healer. Time, time is also, you know, there, there becomes a sort of a wall which you can, you don't cross once it's got, uh, done over with. But there must be something which you would be remembering, if not every day, at least once or every alternate day. So what when, is I, think of, uh, when I think of uh, our cactus and uh, Maldives, there are some very vivid images that, uh, I mean, memories that return to me every time. One is the uh, one I mentioned about sitting in the aircraft, not knowing where we were going and just quietly sitting there. Uh, Brigadier Bulsara asking me to go and uh, 
speak with uh, group captain bevor and group captain goel that was a very memorable moment for me and i as a young flight lieutenant wanted my aircraft to be in the lead so i ran and did all those things so that keeps coming to my mind again and again once in the aircraft i knew that my job was to dispatch the troops in case a paradox was to be carried out i wouldn't be landing in the maldives i would be coming back with the aircraft after the paradox so as a parachute jump instructor or as a logistics officer in the air force i would never be a part of an operation like this so i wanted to carry some good memories i used to be carrying a small notepad all the time so i went around taking some notes writing something and i wasn't very satisfied with all that so i saw brigadier bulsara sitting very quietly after briefing everyone and he was concentrating some thoughts were coming to his mind so i walked up to him i used to be very courageous as a young flight lieutenant i stood up stood in front of him saluted him and uh, i flipped open my pad in front of him and i said sir what are the thoughts coming to your mind now please read for me and he wrote a beautiful note he said that by 1000 hours tomorrow we'll rescue the president and secure the island and they did it well before that so that note uh, the memory of that uh, interaction with brigadier bulsara uh, keeps coming to me then uh, i hadn't uh, i didn't have much to do in the aircraft the troops had prepared everything four hours were to be spent in the aircraft and as an air force officer i had more liberty than the army troops there and the army officers so i was going around and meeting everyone uh, chatri mata ki jai Uh, boosting their morale and all those things then i walked up to the cockpit sitting behind the crew in a row there were some people and among them was uh, the indian high commissioner mr ak banerji sitting very quietly very composed and uh, i was surprised to see a person uh, sitting there in civil dress normally you don't have uh, people when you are on a mission you don't have uh, any one in civilian dress in an aircraft so i stood with my hands on my waist and i said who are you literally and he said i am the indian high commissioner so i came to attention straight away saluted him and i said sir what's coming to your mind now why why don't you write for me and then he wrote i hope that everything goes off as planned so that note is another memory for me next day when we you've landed, kept all these sir these little little notes yes, I, so get able sara wrote I, for you I, and I, mr banerji wrote i don't know where i have put the originals <laughs> but i have photocopies of those okay so the uh, next day when everything was over in the night we were running around shooting at the uh, ship carrying the terrorists and didn't know where the bullets were flying from it was, it was a hide and seek for us for uh, me and one of my warrant officers who had landed who had stayed with the troops so next morning when everything uh, became quiet the president was rescued and uh, troops started moving between the two islands i had again nothing to do i sat in a boat went to the other island i met uh, major mohammad zahir he was one of the top uh, leaders of the uh, national security service at that time so i walked up to him and i said i want to meet your president so he said he looked at me he said flight lieutenant you want to meet my president so i said yes i want to meet your president so he was very nice person very apologetic he said my president has not slept for a very long time and he is resting if it is fine with you uh, i'll take you to him sometime later i said my job is done i am going back now very soon i'll be airlifted back to agra why don't you write something for me in my diary so he wrote uh, we are thankful to the indian armed forces for the assistance given to the uh, maldivians and that note and then with that he gave me his cap badge and his formation sign as a souvenir so those are the vivid memories on return to agra uh, i really i came to know that uh, i stayed there i stayed back uh, for more uh, more time than i was scheduled to stay 
I was supposed to come back in the aircraft in the night itself, but I came back next morning. Uh, next morning, I came back uh, two or three days later. So uh, when I didn't return, my suitcase was uh, sent back home. Uh, some sergeant took it there and handed it over to my wife. And she was in tears. She said, where is my husband? I hear this operation taking place in the Maldives. And normally if he is staying back there, he would need a suitcase. Why, are you, why have you got it? He kept on explaining her that uh, he has stayed back for some reasons and uh, he couldn't have carried it. So it's an operation. He couldn't have carried his suitcase there in the operation. So she wouldn't believe and she went to my CEO and she, she was satisfied only when he said some consoling words and he said, okay, don't worry, he'll be back soon. He's one of the lucky guys who has, who has participated in this operation. So those <laughs> are the memories I one of Those wonderful memories, you know, which only a forgy wife can have. You know, I have so many of them and I can, I can really understand what you're talking about. You know. That's wonderful. And uh, in addition to this, uh, eventually when you came back and, uh, you know, when everything was done and, uh, you know, it was a very secret operation. So, I mean, what, what, what happened with uh, your, your CEOs and your, uh, uh, you know, setup? Did they want a debrief and did it become public? Now it's been now more than 30, more than 30 years. So, did it become public later on? And, uh, you know, because very few people who know what happened there, it's, a, it's not an operation which is talked about so much. You know, like IPKF at Sri Lanka has talked about very heavily. So you have a lot of things which are in public domain. So, I mean, I just wanted to understand that. This, uh, this operation, Operation Cactus, was a lightning operation in the true sense of the term. Uh, on 3rd of November, on uh, 4th of November, uh, the morning newspapers were splashed with the headline, uh, coup in Ma Malay, in Maldives. Indian forces rushed and all those things. And by the time the first eyes fell on those lines, the president had already been rescued. Ah, right. So it was a lightning operation in that sense. By the time next day, the uh, news, uh, news came in the newspapers that the operation is complete, troops are already coming back. So uh, people didn't realize that this operation had taken place. I mean, it made headlines, all right, but then people didn't realize that such an operation has taken place and so many troops were moved to Maldives and brought back. And Sri Lanka was uh, boiling at that time. So the attention was not on this operation, hardly any attention. And uh, to add to it, when uh, Brigadier Bulsara recommended quite a few names for uh, gallantry awards and even uh, the Air Force uh, Group Captain Webu names were uh, recommended for uh, gallantry awards. And sadly, people said that uh, nobody died. There was no blood. So what are you talking about in operation? That's why uh, nobody talks about this operation. There is uh, nobody wants to know much about it and uh, things are going on that way. I mean, it's a human psychology, I think. But then, you know, it is the most successful operations are those in which you don't have ca fatal casualties. So I think, uh, you know, we need the public Sunzu. to understand that. Sunzu said that, I mean, the best victories are those in which uh, you win without uh, any bloodshed. Yes, absolutely. This is one of them. And uh, it was, I mean, just imagine uh, there is certain element of luck also. Under similar circumstances, when uh, the Indian troops landed in uh, Japanese university campus, there were, uh, I mean, so many casualties were there. In this case, if the aircraft had been shot, probably this would, uh, this operation would have been known uh, to more people. Yes, absolutely. Right. Uh, so as we move towards the end of the show, I would like, uh, you know, the, our audience to know that you have written a beautiful book. 
very well read. Everybody wants to read it. There are books on Operation Cactus, but then the one which you've written, I mean, if somebody has read all of them, yeah, you know, I have people telling me that it's one of the most beautifully analyzed book. Uh, do you have a copy of it, sir, to show it to our audience? I, I was expecting I have got one. Oh, wonderful. Uh, the audience will be extremely happy to see this. It's wonderful. And uh, it's, it's really Not beautiful. which was written by Brigadier Bulsara is here. Okay. Very nice. So you've kept uh, it safely here. Huh? And then uh, the cabbage and the formation sign. Mm -hmm. Which you got from that major. Yeah. yeah. Ah, ha, ha. Very nice. Wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, I would like uh, to mention two things yes. about this book. I mean... Uh, I've uh, taken a lot of pains to write this book, and it's very dear to me. Any, I mean, every author loves his book, his work. But this is written in three parts. The first part uh, deals with uh, the history, how how it happened, and uh, up to the point where the terrorists enter Maldives. Second part deals with the operation per se, and the third part deals with the analysis of a lot of things, things which uh, people would not normally understand how paratrooping could have taken place and other things. And the most, uh, I mean, people, what people have liked is the uh, prologue and the epilogue. In the prologue, I have written about three things which affected this operation, which were, I mean, when they happened, nobody knew that these were going to affect the operation, but they did affect the operation in a big way. One was uh, the presence of the Indian High Commissioner in Delhi that day. He came with us and he was like uh, a moving map. He was an encyclopedia. We didn't know much about the Maldives and we had someone who could tell us. Then uh, second thing is uh, the, uh, the availability of a coffee table book. It was presented by one of the ministers, Maldivian ministers to the Lieutenant Governor of Andamans. That time, uh, General Oberoi. So General Oberai passed it on to his son, Major Harkirat Singh, who was posted in Agra that time. So that coffee table book came in very handy. Okay. And the third thing is, I relate, I mean, it's uh, in a very lighter way, I have related it to the uh, first uh, prisoners, the uh, criminals from uh, UK landing up in Australia. It happened 200 years ago. If you consider... 1988, it happened in 1788. 26th January, they had touched down there. So, uh, 1988 was the 200th anniversary of that first landing of uh, the uh, convicts in uh, Australia. They celebrated as Australia Day. That year, it was celebrated with much fanfare. The navies of uh, friendly countries were invited. Indian Navy was one of them. INS Godavari had participated in those uh, celebrations and was returning from there. As luck could have it, these terrorists, when they, they were running away, that ship was uh, on high seas near Sri Lanka and was able to apprehend them. So these three incidents had a bearing on the operation, but one didn't know when they uh, when these incidents were taking place. One didn't know what they will affect the operation. Wonderful, so absolutely right, nice, and it's so good to hear all this because we never hear. You know, it's so less talked about an operation that it's just wonderful to hear about the nitty gritties and those little nuances which we you know as common men it is be very difficult for the audience to know. If there was one very interesting thing, sir, as we were all journalists that time, and uh, you know, once. Uh, we were told, you know, you were not the somebody from uh, one of the at the foreign correspondents club said, you know, you were never uh, the first choice for, uh, you know, seeking help by uh, Maldives. So I believe they went to US first. The US president said, we are ready to help you, but it'll take two, three days to reach. Then they went to, and before that, they went to Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Singapore, who said that we are not capable, we don't have the military power to uh, do such a, such a thing, such an operation. And then, you know, that Margaret Thatcher, the then uh, Prime Minister of UK, uh, they called her and she said, you know, I, we can do it. Our ships are there, but they are far away. So why don't you just ask India? India is the best country. It has all the, you know, requirements and it'll be able to help you. And knowing very well that India was also in Sri Lanka at the moment with IPKF, 
and it turned out to be the biggest success ever. So, you know, the audience always feels that, uh, you know, when we are doing something, so we are doing an operation, probably the, we were always the first choice and, you know, we did it. But here we were the last choice and it just worked, you know. So, uh, you know, President Kayum always said that uh, had I uh, done it, had I not wasted time in my telephone calls, <laughs> it could have happened four or five hours prior to what happened before. So, that's it. so it's just wonderful to hear that. And uh, I think, sir, it's, uh, that's a, there's a real, you know, news which says that there's a Bollywood film which is going to be made. Discovery is made a... Discovery uh, has made a one. documentary. Uh, uh -huh, it's made a documentary, isn't it? And uh, what let's, uh, I mean, we want, before we leave, we'd like to know about this Bollywood film. The audience would be very happy to know, you know, what it what it's going to be like with all the best actors, you know, in town, in the country, being there, you know. So, I mean, we just very really happily want to know about it. Ever since uh, my book was published, I have been approached by nearly half a dozen uh, filmmakers. And uh, whenever they came to me, I said that the, I mean, they wanted to buy the copyright and go ahead and make the film. And then uh, you know how they twist the stories and uh, then the Air Force doesn't like, uh, like it and uh, it starts a process every time when some such film is made. So I've been telling them that the copyright is with the Center for the Air Force Studies. You can approach them for the copyright. I can be of help. I can, since I have the knowledge, I've done the research, I've gone, gone through the official records, I've interviewed people. So I know a lot about the operation and I'll be able to help you. But so far as the copyright is concerned, it is with CAPS, the Center for Air Power Studies. Right. So lately, uh, I mean, the Center for Air Power Studies was not ready to give the copyright to anybody. Uh, I mean, the there has been a policy change now. Uh, they have agreed to give it to three people, Group Captain Bebur, uh, Colonel uh, Brigadier Joshi and uh, Commodore uh, Gokhale. So those three people are uh, now coordinating with a filmmaker and he is trying to make a um, web series. Okay. All right. so that'll be wonderful. We look forward to seeing it. And I'm sure, you know, you must exercise your right of seeing the script before it goes into actual production. Because you I, never know what, you know, happens to it. I'll, so I'll I think, be too happy if they make one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So it's been wonderful, you know. It's what a lovely time. You know, we actually uh, we, we forgot to look at the clock. It's so wonderful. It's such a, you know, when such stories come out and they come from the horse's mouth, nothing could be better than that. Because, you know, when the audience is seeing, we've always, you always know the technicalities of things from here, there, and in a Google era from Google. But when it comes from a person who's undergone it, seen it, visualized it, and actually lived the moment, nothing like it, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for being on the show with us. It's just been wonderful. And we look forward to, you know, many more. And we look forward to seeing both the movies. I hope it's a web series. And then later on, also a full Bollywood saga with all the high, high profile actors. You know, my favorite is Akshay Kumar. So I really hope he's going to be there. I just wish he's there, you know. So I'm just keeping my fingers crossed. Now we hand us over to Chitali, sir, who's, I'm sure, giving this big, bright smile. <laughs> She's waiting for us to finish. Chitali, over to you. I mean, I have lost my words. Thank you so much, sir. I was not, I, I wasn't a part of uh, this um, operation, definitely. Neither I was journalist at that time. But uh, sitting here and listening to you, it started giving me goosebumps if I can show you. I mean, it, it's, it's so intense. And um, I'm sure the audience, when they hear it, they will have the same feelings. And I'm more sure that those who haven't read the book, just to know more about it, they will now start grabbing the copies. I mean, I will be one of them, of course. I would love to read. I would love to know more about uh, the details because we could not incorporate everything in this uh, short time. And I'm sure uh, everybody will be, we are eagerly waiting for the movie also. But before that, I think we are more eager to get the gra the, grab the copy of the book and read more about this uh, mission. Thank you so much, sir. It was wonderful to hear you. Thank you, ma'am. It was a lovely time today. And uh, I got to, as usual, my knowledge bank increased. <laughs> 
right thank thank you. you sir thank you very thank you. much thank you. great to have thank you on you the so show much, sir, sir. right okay you. bye sir bye have a nice day all of you bye